May 1st, 1943. Is it imperative to act, to do something difficult when you see innocent but foreign lives being lost to the aggression of a terror regime? Or should you consider domestic politics first in order to keep your own people cozy and warm? This week, the US and Great Britain choose to let tens of thousands die rather than upset their own citizens. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, we saw how the SS began their violent cleansing of the Warsaw Ghetto. The Japanese condemned any American pilots who would be caught on Japanese soil to a one-way ticket to hell. In Germany, more White Rose non-violent opposition members were sentenced to death, while Allied bombs rained down on German cities in the Battle of the Ruhr. In Belgium, members of the resistance ambushed a train transport taking 1,631 Jewish internees to Auschwitz, allowing close to 100 to flee to relative freedom. This week, on April 29, it is the Dutch who attempt to strike at their Nazi occupiers by organizing a strike. Like with earlier labor protests in France, Belgium, and Greece, it is the Arbeitseinsatz, the forced conscription of young Dutch men for labor in Germany, that triggers half a million Dutch to lay down their work. On April 29, former Dutch soldiers who were sent home after the Dutch surrender in May 1940 are called in to report as prisoners of war after all, so that they can be put into forced labor. In protest, factory workers in the east of the Netherlands go on strike. It is a wild strike without any central planning, but it soon spreads to the rest of the country. While the factory workers walk out, farmers refuse to submit their milk products, instead selling it on the black markets, giving it away, or even flushing it down the drains. It is unclear exactly how many, but up to 500,000 Dutch take part in the protest. Higher SS and police leader in the Netherlands, Hans Rauta, sends out the order police and SS with orders to open fire on any gathering of five or more people. They arrest countless strikers and the protest leaders. Several hundred Dutchmen are wounded and 95 are killed. Of the arrested, 80 are summarily executed and their names published as a warning against continued insubordination. By May 3rd, the protests have been quenched. It's part of the end of what might be called a long honeymoon phase between the Dutch general public and the Nazi occupiers. The Germans expected their Germanic neighbors to submit to their ideology and policies. And for the most part, the Dutch public has passively accepted the occupation and the anti-Semitic measures. Now that the German occupation is looking increasingly parasitic and more Dutchmen choose to resist, the Netherlands has also entered the caustic cycle of resistance and reprisals that is legion in Nazi-occupied lands. Efforts to fix the German labor shortage also continue spilling over into the Nazi mass torture and murder machinery. SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler has been vacillating between wholesale immediate extermination of undesirables and killing them by labor. Now he takes another step towards the latter. On April 27, he directs concentration camps to avoid murdering any people who are able to work. Until now, anyone in the camps that suffered from long-term illness or was considered mentally ill was likely to receive Sonderbehandlung 14F13, Special Treatment 14F13. In the SS bureaucratic nomenclature, 14 means that they are under the concentration camp inspector's command. F is for deceased, and 13 denotes that death was murder by gas. The operation has been in place since early 1941 and soon targeted not only victims that were not fit for labor, but also those liable for incarceration for being undesirable, who, as listed in the Bavarian Penal Code of 1936, are gypsies, vagrants, tramps, work shy, idlers, beggars, prostitutes, troublemakers, repeat criminals, bullies, repeat traffic offenders, psychopaths, and the mentally disturbed. Soon added to the potential list for murder were inmates of Jewish descent, political dissidents, the elderly, and, well, anyone the concentration camp commander felt was a burden to them. 
At first, the murders were outsourced to the euthanasia T4 gassing facilities, but as that program ostensibly ended in August 1941, gas chambers were added to the concentration camps that did not already have one. Then, in 1942, as labor became scarcer, the rules for who was to be murdered under this order were tightened. And now, Himmler's orders means that only those truly unfit for work shall be murdered by gas, while the rest shall be exploited. So slow murder by labor instead. They receive slightly more food, and those who fall ill are patched up to be sent back to work whenever possible. The camps get medical staff added in order to prolong the lives of working bodies for as long as possible. Or, as Richard Glücks, inspector of the Nazi concentration camps, puts it, the best doctor in a concentration camp is not the one who thinks he has to distinguish himself by inappropriate toughness, but the one who keeps the ability to work as high as possible. In a perverse twist, many of the mentally ill, previously victims of the T4 program, have been sent to the concentration camps instead, and are now the main victims of special treatment 14F13. By the end of 1943, up to 20,000 men and women will have been murdered under the order. A number that is, of course, dwarfed by the deaths in the extermination factories in occupied Poland. In London, the Polish government in exile, especially the two Jewish members, Ignacy Schwarzbart and Shmuel Ziegelboim, have been pressing the West to do something, anything, to offer relief and some kind of rescue plan for the Jews already dying or about to die in occupied Poland. During 1942, they have been relentless in authoring articles, making appeals, and trying to get attention for their fellow Jews' plight. Last December, Jan Karski, the Polish agent who investigated and delivered the detailed report on the Holocaust to the West, met with Siegelboim to deliver a message from his guide to the Warsaw Ghetto, Leon Feina. Let them go to all the important English and American offices and agencies. Tell them not to leave until they obtain guarantees that a way has been decided upon to save the Jews. Let them accept no food or drink. Let them die a slow death while the world is looking on. Let them die. This may shake the conscience of the world. Siegelboim's wife and two sons are still in the Warsaw Ghetto, and in the first months of the year he has repeatedly tried to convince Schwarzbach that they start such protests. But they both know that the harsh reality is that it's hard to see what can be done in practice, except win the war. What they hope to at least achieve is a relief for the present refugees and new SKPs from Nazi occupation. Presently, they are being turned back both in the US and in British Palestine, often to return to occupied Europe and certain death. Schwarzbart fears that protests will ruin the effort to change this and convinces Siegelborn to proceed diplomatically. This week, a US and British delegation finally meets in Bermuda to discuss exactly that. After 11 days of deliberations, they will conclude that neither country is ready to take the domestic political fallout of raising immigration quotas to the US and lifting the ban on Jewish immigration to British Palestine. So the Jews must do like the Dutch, fend for themselves in the face of overwhelming oppression. For the vast majority, that will only mean to choose between dying by letting them murder you or dying while resisting. As we have seen, the inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto, including Ziegelborn's family, have chosen the latter. As this week begins, many of the Jewish fighters are still alive, but they have now been forced underground by the SS and auxiliary troops and their efforts to torch the ghetto. Fighter Sima Rotem writes that, The most noticeable thing is the lack of air, water, and food. On the tenth day since the action started, the ghetto is burning. Charred bodies are everywhere on the streets, in the courtyards, and in the cellars. People are being burned everywhere. At the end of April, Rotem used one of the secret passages to Warsaw outside the ghetto to get in touch with the Polish Home Army and to ask them to help evacuate as many as possible. That will be difficult at best, as the commander of the SS task force, Jürgen Stropp, is making horrendous progress. He has formed seven search parties to enter the ghetto with the following order. Every building is to be combed out once more. 
Dugouts have to be discovered and blown up, and the Jews have to be caught. If any resistance is encountered, or if dugouts cannot be reached, the buildings are to be burnt down. On the 25th, Strop reports having caught 1,960 Jews alive, as well as having killed at least 274. He also writes that he will send a number of the caught Jews to Treblinka, where they will be gassed. The next day, Strop writes that 1,330 Jews have been pulled out of dugouts and immediately destroyed 362 Jews killed in battle. This continues the entire week. On May 1st, Strop gives a rundown of the operation's results so far. In general, it has to be stated that our men need extraordinary diligence and energy to discover the Jews who are still in so-called dugouts, caves, and the sewage system. It can be expected that the remainder of the Jews who formerly inhabited the ghetto will now be caught. The sum total of Jews caught so far has risen to 38,385. Not included in this figure are those who died in the flames or in the dugouts. One patrol discovered an unascertainable number of corpses floating in a main sewer under the ghetto. Outside of the ghetto, in the immediate vicinity of Warsaw, the gendarmerie has shot a total of 150 Jews who could be proved to have escaped from Warsaw. But the Jews in the ghetto who remain are not giving up, and Strop's troops continue setting house after house aflame to either drive out or roast alive the men, women, and children, refusing to go willingly to their deaths. A block's distance from there, on the 25th, the Polish inhabitants of the city are celebrating Easter Sunday. For Christians, a day of joy and celebration and a reminder of the resurrection of Christ. It is spring and the mild weather has tempted scores of Varsovians to come to spend a day in the parks and on the streets, despite, or perhaps because, of the hardships of war and occupation. Polish poet Czeslaw Miloc watches revelers on a carousel set up in a park as the soot flakes and smoke from the smoldering ghetto and its dying inhabitants waft by in the air. He's reminded of how freethinker Giordano Bruno was brutally burnt at the stake by the Catholic Church on a lively market square in Rome 343 years earlier. I thought of the Campo dei Fiori in Warsaw by the sky carousel one clear spring evening to the strains of a carnival tune. The bright melody drowned the salvos from the ghetto wall and couples were flying high in the cloudless sky. At times, wind from the burning would drift dark kites along, and riders on the carousel caught pedals in midair. That same hot wind blew open the skirts of the girls, and the crowds were laughing on that beautiful Warsaw Sunday. Never forget.